Good. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Vust, which is a fairly new language, um, and in particular my month with playing around with Rust. Um, so a bit of background about me. Um, my name is James Livingston, um, and my job is dealing with Enterprise Java and JBoss. Um, I've been learning Haskell on and off over the past two years or so, um, a bit before we started the Your Year lectures here, um, but I'm not a super experienced Haskell person. Um, and I know a few other languages like Scala, C and C++, and a few other bits and pieces here and there. Um, I sort of have a science and maths background, um, which is mainly some of the things in functional programming. I see sort of the, the parallels in maths with it. Um, and one thing I'm quite interested in is trying to see um, industry actually use all of the really nice things that um, people have been researching and inventing over the past few decades, um, which sadly doesn't seem to happen as much as we'd like. Um, I've been reading about Rust for probably 18 months or so, um, reading the blog posts from the developers and seeing how it's changed, um, but I never actually tried to use Rust myself at all um, until the start of June after I volunteered to talk about it um, at the pub afterwards after the main meeting. Um, so I decided I should actually start learning it since I was going to give a talk on it. Um, so today I'm going to go just quickly over what Rust is and the basics. Um, I'm not going to talk about syntax and lots of that boring stuff. Um, if you want to learn about that, um, there's some great resources to learn it from. What I'm mostly going to be talking about is the parts that are interesting um, and different in Rust compared to other languages. Um, and how my first month went, and sort of what I, what I think about Rust. Um, I have a few examples, um, not too much code, but they're mostly stolen from the Rust book. So Rust was started as a personal project in about 2006, um, and it became public when Mozilla started to sponsor it in 2009, um, first time public in 2010, shortly afterwards. Um, they've had a self-hosting compiler about a year after that, originally the compiler was in written on Camel, and 1.0 was released in May this year. Um, they're doing minor releases fairly quickly. Um, they're following Firefox's release system, um, so they have a new minor version every six weeks, so 1.1 is already out, and 1.2 will be out in a few weeks' time. Um, there's been a few sort of eras of Rust development um, with massive, massive changes in the language, um, especially around the type system. Um, it sort of aims as a systems language, um, so it's strict and impure, um, but various forms of safety are very important in Rust, um, in particular memory safety, uh, which is at the top of their list of goals for the Rust language. Um, it maintains this by using an ownership system, um, so it doesn't have garbage collection. Um, you can implement garbage collection as a library, but it's not built in. Um, and this ownership system is one of the different parts of Rust that takes a bit of getting used to. Um, it's not the same as uniqueness typing, um, but it obviously has parallels with it. Um, in my opinion, Rust actually pays attention to some of the research people have been doing over the past few decades. Um, various other recent languages in the past decade or so, um, some of them seem to have ignored all the research that people have done since the 70s. So what Rust actually is, um, it's been aimed as sort of a replacement for C and C++. Um, one of their goals is um, to stop people using that language and <laughs> um, that, that hasn't been written since the 70s. Um, so a lot of the, the goals behind it are things that people who currently use C and C++ would want. Um, so zero cost abstraction, um, which is a term that C++ tends to use. You don't pay for features you don't use, and even the ones you do use, they should have as minimal impact on performance um, and runtime as possible. Um, a big goal is interoperability with C. So that way you can call C libraries and you can incrementally replace parts of your application library written in C or C++ with Rust because of that compatibility. Um, it's aimed at being very efficient. Um, the idea is um, you could, if you wanted, write something like an operating system kernel in Rust. Obviously there will be bits that can't be written in Rust, um, the same way that you can't currently write a kernel in pure C, you need a few bits of assembly. Um, but one of the things I want to do is say you could, if you wanted, write a Linux kernel module in Rust. Um, there's a fair chance it wouldn't be accepted in the kernel, but you could actually write one. 
Um, it's sort of arguable about whether this is a competitor to Go. Um, it's often compared a lot with Go because they were started about the same time um, and have a certain amount of overlap in some of the areas that want to sort of take people and projects from. Um, but it's also quite arguable that it's not really competitive to Go at all. A lot of the, the goals of the language and design decisions means different people will use it for different projects. Um, as I said, Rust is memory safe um, outside of unsafe blocks. Um, so you can't possibly use a variable after it's been freed. You also can't double free anything. Um, another important part of this memory safety is that there are no data races. Um, and what this means is if you have multiple pointers to the same area of memory and there's no synchronization um, and one can write, that would be a data race. Um, so this happens often in multi-thread applications where threads race each other. Um, but as I'll talk about a bit later, this actually occurs in single-threaded applications as well, when you do things like modify a collection that you're iterating over at the time. Um, so I mentioned earlier there are a few sort of eras in Rust um, which are quite different. The, the goals of the language have basically always been the same, but how they implement that in the language and the features are quite different. Um, the sort of the first area was a personal project where it was uh, great in just prying out things and um, doing a bit of research. Uh, then Mozilla got involved and quite a lot of things changed when it sort of tried to become a bit of a more serious language. Um, the third era was something they called the type state system, uh, where you could actually represent states of, of objects and structures in the type system um, rather than just what type they were. So you would know whether a file was open or closed. Um, in the end, that got removed. Um, they had a lot of complexity and they figured out better ways of solving those problems. And some of the, the fourth and current era was the lead up to 1.0, where they stripped a lot of things back, back and removed a lot of um, library and features that they decided weren't either weren't useful um, or weren't ready for prime time. So there's quite a lot of Rust which um, this in the standard library is marked as experimental um, because they're still figuring out if that's the best way of doing it. Um, Mozilla has a project called Servo, uh, which is a replacement for the Gecko rendering engine, which is written in Rust. Um, and that's quite a big test bed for Rust. Um, it's a quite a non-trivial piece of software writing HTML and CSS rendering engine. Um, and by using this as a test bed, they'll be able to see which things work in practice and which don't. Um, the Rust community is sort of quite interesting. Um, the language and the standard library is both ch changed uh, with the use of RFCs, uh, which are hosted on GitHub in issues. Um, all core developers use this as well, and everything's open for public comment. So um, since about 0.5 or so, uh, I believe when this started happening, the development of Rust has been quite open. The people that sort of have been using Rust so far um, are about a third each of systems programming people, so C++ developers about a third from scripting language people, and about a third from functional language people. Um, this means it's sort of an interesting mix um, playing between those three communities, um, and despite what you see in other various areas, they actually all three get on quite well. Um, Rust is very open to ideas from functional programming. Um, as I mentioned later, it's actually stolen quite a few ideas from Haskell um, and other functional languages. Um, and it's been sort of quoted before that, uh, that Rust is probably um, ML um, in C++ clothing. So it's, it's not a particularly great analogy, but it has quite a few things from ML um, in that it is sort of a, a functional language, but it's not pure and it is street. So first is a quick example of code. Um, I'll just quickly go through this. The, the syntax isn't particularly important. Um, this is just to show you what the language looks like. Um, this is slightly more complicated than Hello World because that would be a very, very boring example. So here we print out some lines, uh, we read an answer into the string and then print it back out again. Um, a few things that you can notice here um, is you have to import I.O. The step, the prelude for Rust is incredibly small. It is essentially the, the basic types, like your various numeric types, um, and pointers and uh, references and a few things, and all of the the, uh, the traits, which are like type classes, which are required for the compiler to do its job properly. 
basically everything else is not imported by default. Um, strings obviously are. So one thing we'll do is you create a new string and um, the user's let to declare bindings, and this is a mutable binding because we need to change the string. By default, bindings in Rust are immutable, um, so you can't change their contents. Um, that's a bit more complicated than something like Scala where you just have var and val. Um, it is actually more complicated now, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, when we read the line, um, this actually returns a result, which is like an either in Haskell. Um, here, because it's a simple code, uh, we use OK to turn it into an option and then expect to say, just, just assume it's right and get the value out. Um, obviously, in real code, you would use proper error handling and not do this, but um, this is a fine example. Um, and it's got string interpolation, uh, which is type safe as well, um, using a macro. Um, the print line there has an exclamation mark because it uses a macro to make sure that your format specifier matches what you actually pass it. Um, one thing in Rust here, um, it's not overly important but is a um, bit interesting, is semicolons um, are used as a, an expression separator. Um, they are not a terminator. Um, the reason the last line has a semicolon at the end is because it returns um, a, a void or unit type. Um, if you write a function that actually returns a value, um, you can use return, but alternatively you can just leave it as the last line with no semicolon um, and it returns that. Um, Rust has a lot of the things you'd expect in any recent language. Um, it has pattern matching, including with guards. Uh, you can do destructuring, so if you have a tuple or uh, a more complicated data type, um, you can use that in the left-hand side of a binding and destructure it. Um, things you'd expect in imperative languages, um, if for while loops, um, it has great support for higher order functions. Um, it doesn't currently have support for higher kind of types, and I'll explain why a bit later after I've gone through a few other things. Um, that is something they're looking at, but it's more complicated than it is in something um, like other languages like Haskell, um, just to integrate them with everything else. So the Rust type system is probably the first interesting bit. Um, there's quite a variety of primitive types, um, and these aren't primitive in the Java sense, where you have primitive types and objects. Um, these are just your basic types. Um, your numeric ones consist of a letter, which says what sort of kind of base of number it is. So U for unsigned integers, I for signed integers, and F for floats, and then a number which specifies how many bits it is. Um, it has the, all the lines you'd want there. Um, it supports um, structs, um, like C, these are just places to store your data in. Um, it has enums, which are much better than C's um, enum types. Uh, these are essentially a full ADT, um, so like a data declaration in Haskell. Um, and Rust types can be parameterized. Um, as well as parameterizing over types, um, they also get parameterized over lifetimes, uh, which when I get to talk on, talk on Rust's uh, references and how it handles memory, that's quite important. One thing to watch out when reading about Rust online, particularly the type system, pay very close attention to what version it was written for. Um, there's been massive, massive changes to the type system. Um, 0 0.4, 0 0.6 and 0 0.8 have very, very different features and functionality in the type system. So if you are going to try and learn Rust, make sure you're reading about something that was written for 1.0 and not one of the earlier versions. Um, that's one of the problems I ran into. I went, oh, that looks good, and why doesn't this work? Oh, oh right, it's not for Rust, not 1.0. Here's just a bit of sample code with Rust types. We can declare a, a struct um, for some data in a point. Um, none of that is particularly interesting for the syntax. Uh, one thing you will notice in the second example, um, to say point.x um, is 5, you must declare the binding is mutable. Um, unlike something like Scala, where if you, even if you have a val, you can have a mutable class, if the binding is mutable, you cannot, cha no, mutable, you cannot change anything inside it. Um, we've got an enumerated type down here, um, so we declare a, a, a um, quit which has no values to its constructor. Um, you can declare um, either type arguments to the constructor, so that's like a, a, a tuple-like constructor, or you can declare ones where they have names, that's a record-like constructor. 
Uh, one thing you see at the top is you cannot put mutable things in a struct. If you want the contents of your structure to be mutable, you actually have to use a more complicated type to say um, how the memory is referenced. Because, because when you can change the contents, um, who owns that piece of memory is actually very, very important. So you can't just put um, uh, uh, MUT in there and just, oh, it's mutable. Uh, one of the types from the standard library is option, which is great, you don't have to invent it yourself. Um, and it does what you'd expect. You can have a sum constructor that takes a value and none, and it's parameterized over the type T. Um, you can also um, parameterize functions um, over types, which does what you'd expect. Um, Rust doesn't, in the standard library, have things like functor, so um, option is not a functor. Um, and the main reason for that is it doesn't yet support higher kind of types. Um, unlike something, um, unlike Java, you can use sort of the so-called primitive types um, in these generics. So you can say an option of um, i64 because you want to parameterize it over a 64-bit integer. Um, and all of these are handled by the compiler. Um, so it, it doesn't exactly make sense whether they're raised at runtime. Um, they're, they're fully specialized. So if you use an option um, over an int you at uh, an i64, it will actually compile a special variant of some functions um, for that. Uh, one of the more interesting parts is traits. Um, if you use Scala, these aren't the same as Scala traits. These are much closer to Haskell type classes. Um, so here's an example. Um, we've got a circle structure and a trait called has area, which contains a function from the self type to a 64 bit float. Then we're going to declare an implementation um, of has area for circle and use it. So this is essentially the same as having a has area type class in Haskell and declaring an instance of it. Um, your traits can be parameterized over types as well, uh, which will give you the same thing as a multi parameter type class in Haskell. Um, and one other thing you can do, you can also put types inside the trait, um, which the closest thing in Haskell is a module parameter type class where you use functional dependencies. Um, so, so whichever ones are the parameters on the trait itself are like these sort of the input types, and anything that declares a type inside the type class is sort of a, a dependent, uh, not, not, de not dependently typed, but a, a type that is dependent on everything else. Um, one thing you see on the bottom, um, if you read the code, is I've got c.area. Um, this is called method call syntax. And when you use this, this requires that the method is um, declared as part of a trait that the, um, that the structure implements. So in this case, c.area um, looks at the fact we have a circle and what uh, traits are implemented for circle. goes, OK, there's an area function, so it's going to call that. Um, Traits are very, very heavily used in Rust. Um, the core language has several of these, um, I'll talk about a bit later, um, so copy and deref, and these are a very fundamental core part of the language. Um, not the standard library, but the language itself. Um, they're also used extensively for operator overloading, so if you want to overload uh, the plus operator for your type, you need to implement the add trait. Um, the standard libraries collections also make extensive use of these as well. Um, I haven't used them a whole lot myself. Um, I've obviously used things that implement these traits, but I haven't really done enough uh, in Rust to do, implement them myself and use them that way. But they seem reasonably well designed, um, mostly because a lot of their good ideas have been stolen from Haskell. Um, so the developers have come along and gone, yeah, Haskell does type class as well, so let's just borrow all their ideas. Um, as I mentioned, you can declare associated types um, similar to functional dependencies. Uh, in this case, this is from uh, the simplification of the line of the standard library. Um, but we have a mold trait, uh, which is what you implement for the multiplication operator. And you have an input type, which is the right hand side of your multiplication, and an output type, and declares a, a function called uh, mold. And this is one of the ones that is built into the compiler that has special understanding of this. So in this case, you can multiply two 32-bit floats and get a 32-bit float. You can multiply two complex numbers and get a complex number. 
They can also implement saying we can multiply a 32-bit float by a complex number to get scalar multiplication of that complex number. Um, so that way you can implement um, multiplication using the multiplication operator for things that are the same on the left and right hand side. Um, one thing where they're different from Haskell, arguably in a good way, is you cannot declare orphan instances. You can only declare instances uh, or implementations of traits if you are declaring the trait or if you are declaring the structure it applies for. Um, in some cases that can be annoying because you can't do this. Um, I think this is some discussion about having a, an, a way to compile no really idea when to declare an orphan. Um, but as far as I'm aware, right now you just can't declare orphan instances. Um, one thing that's also nice in this, uh, you can have a where clause um, where you actually um, define a type synonym. So if your um, function contains a fairly complicated expression in multiple locations, um, you can put a where clause on your function which defines a local type synonym just for its type, type signature, um, which can be quite nice in things uh, like the collections library, um, these are extensively because you have lots of types that refer to iterators and it's often referenced in several places. So moving on to the second interesting part of Rust is references and lifetimes. Um, and this is probably the hardest part of the language to learn, but is also one of the ones that make Rust what it is. Um, it's related to uniqueness typing, um, it's not the same as it. Um, and in essence, you're allowed to have as many immutable bindings um, to a piece of data as you want, or, and this is exclusive, or immutable binding. So when you have immutable references, you can't mutate the data, so it's safe. Um, and there aren't any problems with uh, data races or memory safety. Or you can have a mutable reference, at which point it's safe to mutate because you know you're the only one who has access to it. Um, and outside of um, an unsafe block of code, there are no exceptions to this. Um, and so by doing this, Rust guarantees memory safety um, and it also forms part of its ownership system. So bindings own their data in Rust. When you declare let x equal whatever, when that binding goes out of scope, um, x will be destroyed. So in this case, uh, we could declare a vector um, of one, two, three. Um, we'll assign a second binding, um, taking its value from the first one, and then try and use the first one again. And Rust tells us you can't do that. Um, V2 has assumed the ownership of the data that V was originally referencing, so you aren't allowed to use V again. Um, and this is very important. Um, even if it is an immutable binding, if you just use normal um, references and of normal um, types and something like this, it takes ownership of that data, so you can't use the first one. Um, and that, that's quite important. Um, for some types, this is relaxed. Um, these implement the copy trait. Um, this essentially says you can use memcopy and duplicate the bits and everything's going to be fine. Um, by default, all the basic numeric types have it. Um, and if you have a structure that only contains um, copyable types, you can also implement copy yourself. Um, if you don't want to do that, you just want to use derived copy and let the compiler do it for you. Um, this is another nice thing that it's borrowed from Haskell where you can um, do deriving of uh, traits. <coughs> One very, very important thing, references to other data cannot implement copy. Um, essentially, if you have a pointer to a piece of memory, you aren't allowed to duplicate that pointer because you have two owners of that memory. And then Rust will no longer know who needs to free that memory. Um, this taking of ownership also extends to functions. So we've got a function foo that takes two vectors. Um, they will assume ownership of that vector, and then whoever called that function can no longer use their, their copy of it. Um, and that's obviously going to be quite annoying. Um, so you say you, you pass a function to, uh, pass a value to a function, and then you want to do something else using that value. Sorry, you can't. Um, one thing you could do, and this would be pretty silly if they made you do this, was you could then just return the values back from the function. Um, so you passed ownership to the function and then it's passed it back to you and you can reassign the bindings. Um, you can reassign them to the same name and that would work. 
But um, frankly, if us did this, no one's going to like it. It's pretty silly to have force you to pass ownership if all the bays back out. So rather than reassigning ownership all the time, what we can do is we can say that the function borrows a reference to that data. And you do that by putting an ampersand in front of the type, which says this is a borrowed reference. Uh, originally, um, during sort of the, the middle time, Rust had about four different types of references, each with a different symbol. Um, they've gotten rid of most of those because they were confusing and no one could remember which one was which. Um, and as well as that, most of the other types um, are either not used very often, so they don't really deserve a shorthand symbol that would encourage people to use them, or they want you to actually think twice about using them. Um, they're, they're quite common, but it is actually quite important to know how they're different than the others. So by using an ampersand here, we can say that the function foo borrows these two vectors, and then we don't need to sort of return them back out. Right, yep. Don't you have to put the ampersand in front of the v1 and v2 in the function call as well? This... Uh, I don't believe so. Oh. OK. Depend on the version. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah on the, the fact that it's a reference is part of the type. And I'm, unless I've messed up this, I'm pretty sure you don't need it um, on the variable name. Um, so in this case, uh, you can declare these two vectors, you can pass them to the function, and then you could use them again. Hooray! We can use data twice. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, so, oh, never mind. I answered my question. Okay. Um, but the other important part about these borrowed references is they don't get destroyed when they go out of scope. They're just borrowed, so the destruction of that data is left up to whoever originally owned it. Um, as I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, these references are immutable. If you want to use a um, immutable reference, you need to put um, ampersand mut on it to say this is a mutable reference. Um, I didn't mention it earlier in the, the first code sample, but when the function wants a mutable reference, you actually need to write ampersand mut on it to say that you really want to pass a mutable reference into this function. Um, which is part of a good discouragement from actually passing any musical things unless you really need to do it. Um, that's basically what I just said, uh, but borrowing is also last to the end of the scope. Um, so if you borrow, uh, a, a, a func borrow for a function parameter, um, it obviously lasts to the end of that function. You can also create borrowings within a local function um, and I'll talk about why you might possibly want to do that in a little bit, but when you do that, they last to the end of scope. So these uh, uses of, of um, borrowings and references, um, one last thing they prevent is invalid use of iterators. The Rust compiler will prevent you from modifying a collection you were iterating over. So for example, we could declare our immutable binding V, which is a vector, and then iterate over it. Um, then we try and just print out a value, which is fine, and then add um, 34 into the vector while we're iterating over it. Um, the demo message is quite long, um, mostly it tells you exactly where you've done everything. But to iterate over a collection, um, the iterator needs to acquire an immutable binding to that collection. Um, so it is borrowed an immutable binding to an immutable reference to it. Then when you try to push a value into the collection, that requires a mutable reference to the collection so it can modify it. And um, as I mentioned earlier, to prevent data races, you can either have a mutable reference or as many immutable references as you want. You can't have both, so the compiler says you can't pass um, a mutable borrow of V um, to the push function because you already have an immutable, bo an immutable borrow in the for loop. Um, which is what it's pointing at in that code there. It says where we have tried to use it in two different ways. Um, so this prevents that kind of problem, which um, is very easy to do in things like Java, accidentally trying to mutate a collection that you're iterating over, and Rust won't let you do it. Could you do it if you um, call this a mutating reference? Um, no, references. no, because you can only have one mutable reference at a time. Um, the, uh, the, the for loop essentially defines a scope and it, borrow, it, it borrows a reference. Even if you could borrow it as a mutable reference, you then can't take another mutable reference inside it because you'd have two at once. Yes. Um, 
So yeah, that, that prevents that kind of problem as well. Um, there are certain ways of writing things if you want to do something like that. Um, and that's where you might have overlapping references. So if you have a, a piece of data, you can declare a local block, take an immutable reference, end the block, start a new sub-block where you're taking an immutable reference. So that way they're not overlapping. Um, but yeah, Rust will prevent these kind of problems um, in the compiler. Uh, another very important thing in Rust is lifetimes. Um, and these are probably the hardest um, thing to understand about Rust because the compiler has really, really um, smart inferencing for this and most of the time you don't need to write them down. And the only time you do need to write them down is when you're doing something complicated and at which point it's hard because it's complicated. <laughs> so all of these references here, so say ampersand i32, which is a reference to a 32-bit um, signed integer, what that really is, is ampersand quote a i32, which is, this is a reference to a 32-bit integer which has the lifetime of a. Um, and the function is parameterized over that lifetime, so it works for any lifetime that lasts the length of the function. Um, you're not going to want to write that down, so Rust doesn't make you do it. Um, the main place where lifetimes have to be written explicitly is when you're declaring a reference in a structure. If you have a structure that has a reference to something else, you have to know how long that reference is valid for. Um, the most common way is just to put um, a quote A um, in the type of the structure and then use quote A again on the reference, just to say that this reference is valid as long as the structure itself is valid, which is most of the time what you want to do. Um, but Rust does force you to write that down, um, just so it knows that's really what you want to do there. Um, I'm not really going to talk any more about lifetimes, um, partially because at the point you need to deal with these, uh, you would have learned a fair bit more about Rust. And the second reason is I haven't learned enough about them myself, so I don't really want to talk about them. Um, but they are a very, very important part about dealing with complicated ownership in Rust. Uh, one thing that I'm not really going to talk about but just mention um, is this database prevention is really great for thread safety. Um, if you have multiple threads, not having databases between them is a really good thing. Um, this doesn't solve all of your other concurrency problems, but it's one you don't have to deal with. Um, two very important traits in the standard library, um, which I'll just mention that exist. Um, send is for things that can be moved into another thread. So if you, if you have a reference to something, you can move that to another thread, um, and that moves ownership across the thread boundary. So the original thread can no longer um, use it. Um, the second thing is things that implement the sync trait. These are safe to be used by multiple threads at once. Um, and I won't really go into what they are, but there's a way to say you can you pass this to uh, another thread, but still keep it yourself. Um, and one thing I also haven't mentioned so far is memory allocation. Um, all of the examples so far have used completely static um, stack allocation. Um, if you want to allocate memory dynamically, um, you actually need a different type for that. Um, so what you'll have is a, a box type, which is essentially a piece of dynamically allocated memory. Um, and this is very important if, for example, you want to return a non-primitive type from a function. Um, you can't put the data um, in, in the stack when the function is and then return a reference to it because it's no longer valid, it's disappeared from the stack because that function's finished. So you might use a box there. Um, and you only have one reference to a box at once. Um, RC is a reference counted structure. Um, this is when you might need multiple owners of a structure. Um, obviously there are some issues with reference counting, but most of the time when you have multiple owners, um, that works. Um, and Rust, in general, tries to avoid you doing this because it, the way Rust is designed is you have very clear ownership of pieces of memory, so actually needing reference counting um, isn't that common. Um, and if you are dealing with reference counting, one place where it turns up is when you're dealing with multiple threads, which point you probably don't want RC, you want ARC, which is atomic reference count. Um, and this is safe to be used by multiple threads at once. Um, there was garbage collection early on in Rust, but it got removed. Um, 
since between the sort of the preference for borrowing and not sharing data and the ability to use reference counting, GC hasn't been seen as that important. Um, the Mozilla Servo um, HTML renderer doesn't need reference counting at all. Um, and another, another big reason for not having garbage collection is that requires you to have a runtime. Um, Rust has a standard library, but it has no runtime at all. So you can use it, say, from C programs or from Python or wherever you want, and it doesn't require um, any runtime. Um, people are working on adding um, or writing various garbage collection um, libraries if you want to use them with Rust, um, but it's not part of the standard, and if it is, it will probably be a fair way down the track once one or more of these sort of uh, third-party garbage collection libraries is seen to be both useful and fairly agreed on in the community. Um, a few things that Rust doesn't have. It does not have guaranteed character optimization. The main reason, um, two reasons for this are the lifecycle handling becomes very, very complicated when you're doing tail calls. Dealing with, um, if, for example, you, you borrow data from, your, from, uh, from someone, but then you have a tail call, when, when does that get released? Um, and the determinism, um, I think I've messed up that next top point, um, but some of the determinism um, that Rust uses in certain places becomes a bit more complicated uh, with tower calls. Obviously, tower calls are still fully deterministic, but it just complicates things that it made it tricky to um, have them. Um, it also means it can't be ABI compatible with C, um, unless anything that is callable from C doesn't use tail calls. So if they did implement them, there'd have to be a whole host of exceptions to that, which um, is obviously not nice. Um, the compiler can and does implement tail calls internally as optimizations. So it will um, do tail calls and, um, and jump rather than doing normal calls, but only as an optimization, it's not guaranteed. Um, and as I mentioned, it doesn't have garbage collection, um, it requires a runtime, and it hasn't been seen as that useful in Rust. Um, another thing that Rust doesn't have is a massive standard library at the moment. Um, in the lead up to 1.0, which was only released uh, about eight weeks ago, there was a lot of things in the standard library they decided weren't either ready or they didn't want to guarantee they were going to um, keep stability of the API. Um, so they've either been taken out of the standard library and moved into a third party module, um, which in Rust called Crates, or been marked as experimental. Um, through the life of 1.0, a lot more of that stuff is either going to be marked stable or moved into this, um, the standard library, but it's not there yet because they weren't sure it was perfect and they wanted to, to make sure things were done properly rather than have something that they'd be stuck with. So my month with Rust. Um, aside from being the blog post that I already looked at before, um, the places I started were with the Rust book from their website and uh, the Rust by example site. Um, the book is not a tutorial. It um, has very short examples of the main features of Rust, but it's definitely, definitely not a tutorial. Um, I tried a few trivial things and then after doing that I decided to do something that's a bit more complicated because trivial things, like in most languages, are trivial and they don't show you anything interesting. So I have a, a log analysis tool that I have written in a few different languages now. The, um, the previous one I wrote it in uh, was Haskell, um, so that way we've learned about parsers and um, a lot of other things in Haskell. I've tried rewriting it in Rust. Um, and I say try because I haven't finished. Um, I ran into a few uh, issues doing that, which I'll talk about. Um, as I said, the tutorials and getting started material is fairly simple, um, and by following things along, you don't have to figure things out, so you don't make any stupid mistakes, um, or if they are the ones they wanted you to make. When you're following a small application by yourself, you'll make a stupid mistake, and then get eaten by the borrow checker. Um, if you've heard anything about Rust, you've probably heard of the borrow checker. It's the thing that, that keeps track of references and bindings and makes sure you're not doing bad things. And unfortunately, it can sometimes be a bit complicated when it spits an error and you go, hmm, what? I, I, I just want to, I just want to like, concatenate two strings. Why is it failing? <laughs> so this is one of the error messages that I have got, which um, isn't entirely helpful when you read it. 
Um, there's a whole lot of parameterized types all over the place there. Um, part of this may have been due to the fact that the um, parts of the library I tried to use was inspired by Parsec, so it's, um, it's quite parameterized all over the place. Um, but I just thought this would, um, I don't know. This isn't in the borrow checker, this is a type mismatch. Um, one thing that is helpful, um, sort of almost at the end, it says these are the two bits that are actually different in the middle of these. Um, but it's still not helpful that the, um, the trace function once parser combinated primitive state underscore is required, but expected to tuple. Um, with, two, with one knowledge, I found one with two. I sat and stared at this for a while, and I said a bit more, and then just deleted my code and rewrote it, and I didn't have to say that those times. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I always wrote on something stupid. <laughs> um, they're not as bad as C++ templates if you're using um, their type errors, they're just ridiculous. Um, but like with GHC and Haskell, you can get very, very dense type errors. Um, Rust does try to be helpful. Um, it's not as helpful as GHC is at the moment, um, but it's getting a lot better. Um, in 1.2, which will be out uh, the start of August, um, there's now another option um, you can pass to the compiler, which is hyphen hyphen explain, where it'll go in much more verbosely exactly what's wrong, so you can try and find out what happened when you see something you don't understand. Which might things might, might make things better and could make things worse. Yes, um, it, the 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 explain mode is not on by default because it makes them much much more verbose, and often you don't need that. By the times when you're really stuck, you can use that and it might give you some more hints. And the particular problem here is I used the slightly wrong function somewhere, so it inferred a wrong trait. Um, and like in Haskell, when it infers the wrong type class somewhere, um, or as a type class constraint, you can get weird errors in an unrelated place, which is what happened. Um, but the first problem I encountered was with strings. Strings, you would hope, are fairly simple, and they almost are. But there are basically two string types in Rust. Um, strings in Rust are always UTF-8, no exceptions. You can either have a blob of bytes or UTF-8. Um, mm. The problem is, if you have uh, the string type, which is part of the collections library, it is a heap allocated string you can pass it down. Um, and that's usually what you use when you declare strings and read them in places. Um, but the other type is ampersand str, which is a reference to a slice of characters. And this essentially means you have a sequence of UTF-8 characters which you want to do something with. And almost all functions that take strings use that one because they want to be more generic and operate on anything that can be viewed as a string rather than just the music collection's string type. Um, so the problem that I first ran into is I've got a string but I'm in ampersand str. Um, what? Can't you just do this for me? And Rust almost does. Um, because these functions take ampersand str, which is they borrow the value of a string, you need to use an ampersand in there. Um, but the type error, particularly if there's some kind of generic um, parameterized types involved, it may not be obvious that's what the problem is. Um, so if you run into this, just throw in an ampersand and it'll probably solve it. Um, by putting in an ampersand, you don't actually directly create an ampersand str. You create a, a reference to a string, which then Rust has something called dereference coercions, uh, which is how you can coerce one type into a different type safely, and it knows how to turn a reference to a string into a reference into an str, and so we'll do that. Is that the int2 trait? Uh, almost. Um, the int2 trait, I believe, is for when you need to explicitly say you want to do it, um, using int2. Um, the dereference coercion is anything that is a reference to something can be coerced into a reference to something else. Um, it's, it's a bit more implicit. Um, it's almost like Scala's implicit um, methods for the sort of coercing types, um, but you, do the, you need a reference there, whether it's an ampersand because you originally had a normal binding or you already had a reference. Um, into, I believe, requires you to say you want to do that. Um, often because you need to tell it what you want to coerce it into. Um, whereas the dereference coercions only apply if it knows the type type already and it just needs to, needs to do it. I thought the underlying implementation used the into trait that was, all, was I thought. That um, this is something I don't know enough about. Um, it may be that anything that has an into trait implementation also gets a dereference coercion or the other way around. 
Um, they, they are separate, but I but they may be linked. So when you when you have one, you get the other. Um, another thing I ran into fairly on with dealing with Rust because I was trying to use a parser is error handling. Um, Rust has two types of errors. Um, failures use the result type, uh, which is like either in Haskell, um, and this is, as you'd hope, a proper ADT, so usually what you use is pattern matching on it, um, or you can use various combinations on it to, to link things in um, different ways. Um, there's also panics, which are essentially exceptions. Um, these are not usually what you'd want to use um, outside of example code, um, because they will crash your application within an hour. Um, and the standard library uses result all over the place. Essentially, if, if there's something can go wrong um, and it can have an, and it can indicate to you why it went wrong, it will use a result rather than an option or just returning a value in panicking, which is good. Um, one thing that is a bit annoying is there's a, a macro called try, which is for chaining potentially failing operations together. Um, that's okay. But having done some functional programming before, it kind of feels like this should really be generalised. Um, and really what they want is a monad. Um, but because they don't have high conjugate types, that isn't there. Um, and high conjugate types are still something they're looking at. Um, it's just got no fixed timeline because, because no one has done the hard work of figuring out how to make high conjugate types work properly with life cycles. Um, it's sort of an open research thing that no one's solved properly yet. Um, so, onto using the parser. Um, there's a few parsing libraries. Uh, parser Combinator was based on Parsec. Um, and that's the first one I went for because my Haskell version of this application used Parsec. Um, unfortunately, Rust doesn't have a, a nice thing to do function composition, which I used fairly heavily in my Haskell code. Um, so, the code I ended up with was fairly hacky. Um, there's one called NOM, which uses sort of a, a state machine using um, either incomplete to indicate it needs more input done or error. Um, I, I switched halfway through to write using that and the code was getting very verbose and I didn't really like writing it, so I gave up on that. And that's where I am at the moment. I've tried writing these using two parts in the libraries. I don't know if I like either of them. Um, there were some more I haven't tried yet. Um, but this is something you'll probably encounter when doing some Rust. Um, the library ecosystem is sort of in the early, I guess, inflationary stage, where people are figuring out the best way of doing things in Rust, and there's a lot of things where best practices haven't really been established. Um, and a lot of these things are written for early versions of Rust, so they're still dealing with the fallout of that, and people rewriting all their libraries to use stable 1.0 stuff, and what to do. So if you want a library to do something in Rust, um, chances are there's either zero or lots, and no one knows which way is the best way to do things yet. Um, that is both bad because it's a bit annoying to try and use them. On the other hand, it is quite good because you can go along and influence these libraries and make you do what they want. Um, I said earlier that, has, uh, that Rust is fairly receptive to ideas from functional programming. Um, as long as it's possible and doesn't get in the way of their sort of zero cost abstraction things. Um, they're very, very happy to steal ideas from functional programming. Um, some of the, the libraries in the ecosystem, like parser combinators, um, uh, go much further that way and they're basically functional programming in Rust. Um, but a lot of the areas will steal as much as it can without compromising Rust's goals. Um, but if you want to get any functional stuff in Rust, um, go join in now, learn about it and get the, the community around us starting using the good ideas that we've already learned. Um, one thing annoying I found dealing with references um, is sort of the, the map or dictionary data structure, where you have a keys and values. Um, that is a bit awkward to use in Rust, because the important thing is, who owns the data? So you put something into this map. Does the map assume ownership, or do you keep it? Um, when you try and get, look up values and get them out, who owns that? And there's a bit of complications. You might think it's simple, but some of the more complicated things where you want to modify values in the map, um, they can become a bit complicated dealing with mutable and mutable references. Um, a fairly common thing to want to do is look up a value in a map, and if it's not there, compute a value and put it back in. Um, so 
that requires both the mutable engine and mutable reference, um, obviously at different times. But often you want to do this in a for loop, um, at which point you may have a reference to the collection somewhere else, and this starts getting a bit complicated. Um, it's not unsolvable and it's not necessarily that difficult. It just requires you to clearly think about things to do with ownership before you start writing code because otherwise you, know, you get yourself in a mess. Um, and this is for, um, something you could say write in C or Java without any problems at all because you don't have to think about it. The problem is if you don't think about it and often screw it up. Um, like, like with the iterating over a collection while modifying it. Um, Rust just forces you to think about these things as you're writing the code and you have to deal with them. Um, which can be annoying at times. So some of the things I've skipped. Um, there's a build tool called Cargo. It seems okay from the very limited use I've had. I haven't tried it too much. Um, it uses something called Crates for package distribution. It works called Crates.io. Um, this is the equivalent to the central Maven repository or package. Um, one nice thing is that when they're doing nightly builds um, of Rust, I don't know if it's every night, but they rebuild all of the open source code on crates.io with the compiler as part of their nightly builds or semi-nightly builds. So that way they know if they've broken anything that's open source, which um, is quite handy. Um, haven't talked about most of the language um, or the standard library or much detail. So um, I haven't really talked about much at all. <laughs> so should you take a look at Rust? Um, <coughs> I think Rust is going to be a very interesting language because it's trying to do things that haven't really been done in what you'd call mainstream languages before. Um, obviously there's languages with uniqueness typing, linear typing, and other languages that have all done this. Um, I believe the, the reference and borrow idea is uh, taken from a language called NIM. Um, but this is possibly going to be one of the first more mainstream languages that tries to do it and is serious about it. Um, it's going to be very interesting to learn how well this works in practice um, for real world things people want to write. So even if Rust turns out not to be great, um, as a whole we're going to learn something about it and about why it didn't work. Um, as I said, the ecosystem around libraries and practices is still forming at the moment. So if you have some good ideas you think every new language should use, now's a good time to try and get into it and get those out there. Um, and learning any languages changes the way you think about programming. Um, I don't think many people would have learned a language and then gone, well, I didn't learn anything at all from that. Um, learning Haskell teaches you a lot about um, sort of functional programming and, and purity and all those ideas. Um, learning any language will change the way you think about programming, so why not give Rust a go? Um, as I mentioned, a few of these kind of disadvantages, a lot of the information on the internet is wrong, um, particularly probably half of Stack Overflow is about previous early versions. Um, a lot of things got pushed out to 1.0, um, they're slowly being brought back in, but they just weren't ready yet. Um, and the tooling does need a fair bit of work. Um, the explain Rust option, uh, sorry it's in 1.1 so it's out, not 1.2, um, that's added which is handy. Um, there is no real debugger to speak of at the moment. There's very, very initial implementation um, of GDB support, so you can kind of put a breakpoint in and print out a value, but that's about it. Um, I believe they, because they use LLVM as a compiler backend, they're using, um, looking at using the, um, the debugger as part of that, but there's essentially almost no work done on that so far. So you don't have a debugger, which is um, somewhat annoying for, for an imperative in pure language. Um, and there's lots of other things in the tooling side of it, like the, the build system, where there's still a lot of things that could be improved. Um, a few people have mentioned to me um, that they'd be interested in learning a bit about Rust. So on Hack Night, a few of us are probably going to get together um, and just play around with Rust. Um, one interesting thing that someone pointed me to on IRC um, was there's a sort of a 2D game development um, tutorial series um, which someone is rewriting to use Rust. So I think that's up to the third or maybe fourth um, sort of, um, I guess, article on that where there's going through writing um, a 2D game in Rust. Um, that should be quite interesting. Um, so although it's not a complicated game, there's obviously sort of your, your things that need to be dealt with in most series programs that game you want shows up a lot of. Um, if you want to learn Rust, um, once you've got past the basics, I would suggest finding a simple tool and just trying to write it or rewrite it. 
nothing too complicated, but something actually useful, so you have some motivation to, to play around with things. Um, and a few people have gone together and are rewriting all of the, um, the GNU core utilities in Rust. So LS, um, LESS, all of those kind of tools, they're rewriting in Rust. Um, not necessarily to try and replace them, um, but it is a good learning exercise for them. And also, we'll, we'll start showing things where Rust standard library or where it's binding to sort of common operating system libraries isn't complete and needs work. Um, here's a few links. Um, I'll probably put them up on the uh, the slides up on the um, the BFPG page, um, so you can get to them. But um, the Rust language site um, is nice. Um, the book on there is quite useful. Um, and there's a thing called 24 Days of Rust, uh, where someone's gone through and talked about different parts of Rust. Um, so that's it for the slides. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, it's been a while since I've looked at Go, <clears throat> but um, what would you say is the, the reason that, um, or the argument to, for or against it being a, uh, Rust being a competitor to Go? Um, the, there's recently been a few people coming with different blog posts on this. Um, in, in essence, the main reason it's a competitor is they come out about the same time and they're sort of, I guess, competing for, for mind share about discussions. Um, because they, they came out, uh, it was about two, both came out about 2009, um, Rust has just come out 1.0 and Go has um, started becoming a lot more talked about like popular in the past year or two. Um, they're competitors in that sense. Um, a lot of people think they aren't really competitors, sort of in a, in a more technical sense, in that um, Go is a language that is garbage collected, um, has a has a runtime, um, and it's aimed. Uh, the, the, the sort of the, one of the things that Go talks about, is, Go has, is it's a simple language, um, and it doesn't have lots of functionality in the language itself. Uh, which is often one of the main reasons it's criticised. It, um, it doesn't have um, generic types outside of the standard library and all that kind of thing. It doesn't have that. Um, so they're, they're sort of competitors in a sense of they're both uh, a new language. They both want developers to come try them out. Um, but they're, they're probably aimed at different targets. Um, I don't know much about Go. I've never tried programming. I've just read a few things about it. But it seems like it's aimed at your sort of corporate Java developer kind of target market, so maybe stealing people from Java. Um, whereas Go is, uh, so Rust is more aimed, um, is, is target is getting people off C and C++, is, is largely, um, it's quite interesting for a lot of other reasons and it's not necessarily only for those people, um, but one of the big goals was to get people to stop using C and C++ um, because it's terribly unsafe and it's easy to shoot yourself in the foot. They were both marketed as systems like this. They just yes. meant different things by systems. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so that's another thing. They're, they're both, yeah. People put that for systems programmers um, and in the bus sense that means like your apps they should be the operating system low, much lower level stuff. Um, whereas Go to so meant systems programmers is I don't know, not functional programming, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, it's not yeah, it's not scripting. Um, uh, one important thing is Rust is not designed as a competitor to Haskell. Um, if you want something that is Haskell, Haskell-like, Rust is not that. Um, it's not a pure language, it's not lazy, um, it doesn't have a lot of, it doesn't have all of the things from functional programming, so it's not really a competitor. Um, it's some of the same people are interested in it, um, particularly people who are interested in programming languages because it's programming languages. They're often interested in both because they are pushing boundaries in different areas, but they're not competitors really for what you use them for. Um, obviously, for a given program, you could write it in Rust or in Haskell or Go. Um, the same way you could write pretty much anything in almost any language. Um, but who they're aiming for is a bit different, and the way they go about it and the, the power and idea behind the language is quite different. Um, Rust is designed to be very efficient, but it is willing to, to make the programmer deal with some complexity to ensure safety. Um, so it tries to make it so you can't shoot yourself in the foot, even if it's a bit harder because you have to do that. 
whereas the least the, the bit I've seen from Go, um, it doesn't give you that kind of safety. Um, its main goal is, is making it easier for the programmer, even if you lose safety as part of that. Um, yeah, hopefully that has been, yep. Um, so if, if there's no runtime, does that mean threading support is basically like p threads or whatever, like it's operating system threads? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the standard library has support for threads, uh, but you use p threads on basically everything that's not Windows, mm -hmm. um, the native Windows stuff on Windows. Um, so when I say there's no runtime, there is there is no sort of um, requirements um, outside of the, the standard library um, and the operating system stuff. So if you yeah, if you as opposed to like like lightweight threads or like green threads. Or yes, um, there are uh, libraries that do that. Yeah, no. the, 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 the there are libraries that do that, but not required. So. Um, if you if you only use the pre prelude and didn't import any of the standard library, um, I believe it would not require any additional code at runtime. Um, I'm not completely certain of that. There's, there's some some traits that the compiler has, um, so I'll probably have a few references. But basically, you don't need the standard library as such, and there, there's nothing that needs to be initialized to put on startup. Um, or destroyed when you shut down. There's no sort of background work happening. Um, yeah, so there's a standard library, but there's no required runtime. So you, you have people using it for embedded stuff. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, you know people are using it for embedded stuff in that case. There's no. Um, I I don't know. Um, I'd assume that people are looking at it. Someone wrote a kernel in point eight by stopping out all the threading stuff and then just mm -hmm. promising not to use it. Yeah. So it just had like bare minimum empty C files yeah. and that. Um, yeah, actually one important point on that. All dynamic memory allocation is part of the standard library, it is not part of the runtime. The the core Rust language only uses stack allocation. Mm -hmm. Um, which is one of the things that uh, would be useful for embedded systems or um, say if you're writing a Lynx kernel module, you won't want to use your C library uh, memory allocation, you want to use whatever the kernel has. So obviously if you're using writing uh, Rust in the kernel, you would not have the Rust standard library, you would have your own the stuff that back backs onto the kernel. Um, but all of the memory allocation in the standard library is the standard library, it's not the language. Oh, so there's, there's really no optional garbage collection? Uh, no. Um, there, there's at least one, if not five, third party libraries who are looking at implementing garbage collection in Rust, um, but it is not part of the standard library. Um, if you want things with multiple owners, there are the RC and ARC types, um, and they, well, depending on what you mean by garbage collection, um, when, whenever, say, a reference or uh, uh, an RC goes out of scope, the compiler automatically dereferences and frees it if it's if it's no longer used. Um, but there, there is not the kind of um, heap scanning um, type, type garbage collection. Right. That's what I meant. Not reference counting. Yeah. Like normal copy collectors and that. Yeah, no, there's not um, copy collectors or anything like that. Um, people have them, um, and particular copying collectors start being very difficult in Rust um, because when you have um, borrowed references to things in in when it's compiled that's turned into a pointer um, and it starts being a bit more complicated to do that um, but people are working on whether it ends up in the standard library who knows um, there's a fair chance it won't because most things um, reference counting and references work um, but yeah let's see how that goes yeah, the, so the board checking, right, that like, gets in your way and stops you from writing certain kinds of code. I mean, obviously incorrect code, yeah. which is the entire point. What sort of other things do you tend to, is there anything that actually Rust can't write because of board checking? Like the expressive language languages like limited or, because like you said, like dictionaries, for example, were very difficult. Um, to keep yeah, the dictionaries are a bit awkward to use, mostly because when you naively use them, you try and do things the same way you do in Java or yeah. C, and, and that's wrong because the way you do Java and C, um, in, in practice it doesn't have problems, but those problems could be there. So Russ goes, well, there could be a problem, I won't let you do it. Yeah, um, so yeah that's a bit awkward. Um, is there anything that actually stops you from doing it entirely, or is it just fine? Um, you can know, um, say blocks if there's yeah. something you have to do. Yeah, yeah so, I was thinking, like in, inside the discipline. 
Is there, yeah. is there stuff that you actually want? So what, um, do, you, what so, do you have to put in an unsafe so block? So what an unsafe block is, you want unsafe open brace and code closed brace. Um, inside that, you can use functions that um, are declared as unsafe. Um, for example, you can cast, you can use raw pointers to memory. Uh, you can cast things which you can't normally do. Um, you can essentially you can violate memory safety and do anything you want. Right. Yeah. Okay. For example, the reference counting is actually implemented using unsafe blocks inside it, so it can have a reference to the value and pass out mutable references. Right. Okay. So. I was kind of curious whether in safe blocks there actually are some things that are impossible. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, like for example, um, you couldn't implement reference counting using only safe code, right. okay. um, because you require shared references, shared mutual references to things. Okay. Um, and un unsafe is not transitive, um, so it's not like the I/O monitor in Haskell. Um, you can put an unsafe block anywhere um, and in, in a safe function. Um, what it is is an indicator, both to the compiler, that you really do want to do something considered unsafe here, so disable the safety checks. Um, but it is also an indication to anyone doing code review, you should really pay attention to this because essentially you're asserting that everything is going to be fine and the compiler won't check it for you. Um, so they're, they're delimited as a, I can do dangerous things here block. You're saying so it's not like something in Haskell. Uh, it's it's not like the IOMonad, so it's not oh. transitive. So so in Haskell, if you have uh, if you want to call a function that is sort of a, an IO action, um, you also need to be an IO action, um, short of using things like um, unsafe perform IO. So is it like that? No, it's not like that. So you can be a safe function and have an unsafe block, and no one no one knows. Um, it's not saying it's a bad function. It's just saying. I'm turning off the compiler safety guarantees and I really know what I'm doing here. And it always proliferates up. No, it, it, so it doesn't, um, it's not, doesn't, it's not transitive, it doesn't propagate upwards. Yeah, so it, it, in Haskell, you don't have to proliferate your unsafe performance. Uh, you, you, you don't have to do that, but if you have an IO action, um, uh, yeah. calling it needs to be an IO action. You can hide it though in Haskell the same. Yeah. So it sounds the same. Um, it yeah, it's, it's kind of similar. Um, yeah, no, the, the unsafe block is, oh, uh, unsafe functions are things you shouldn't call unless you really know what you're doing. And unsafe blocks are an indication that I'm doing something potentially dangerous, really make sure that the code here is correct because the compiler won't check things properly for you. Yep. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the main reason um, you would do that is to things that you can't implement safely within the language. So um, the example was reference counting. Um, to do reference counting, you need um, multiple pointers to the same piece of mutable memory so you can update the reference counts. And last point, you have multiple pointers to writable memory because that would be unsafe. Um, so the reference counting internally needs to use unsafe code so they can update the reference count from multiple places at once. I just Why would you do that? Trouble and say that uh, you would do that if you were trying to port something from Haskell that Ed Commit had run. Right. <laughs> uh, you mean know, with all these unsafe? Yeah. Oh, they always put that stuff in there. I don't know why they do it, but I could ask them. Yeah. If I start writing Rust tomorrow, am I writing reference counting because I don't have garbage collection? Uh, no, reference counting is part of the standard library and oh, it, right. it uses unsafe internally. Um, okay. Yeah, it, it's basically, this is a bit of code that requires violating memory safety um, because you can update right. things from multiple places, so it's, it's not safe. You don't have to. Yeah, you, you don't have but to. Why would I then? I mean, if you're writing reference counting's done. Pardon? If you're writing a complicated collection where you have to do some manipulation with pointers, then you right. might use... Uh, or another way, another example is using the foreign function interface. Um, calling C code is unsafe because it could do anything. Um, so if you mm -hmm. want to call... Um, if you want to directly call C code, it, it requires an unsafe block. Um, usually you have a, a Rust binding, which is uh, the very thin Rust binding will just be a safe function that calls an unsafe block with a few checks in it to make sure things are sensible, or just an assertion that it, it is, it's, it's safe even if you're calling C. Um, that, that's another good example of where, where you need an unsafe block because, well, C code could do anything so you can't trust it. Um, so if I have a series of structs that reference one another in a hierarchical sense, the owner of the top one would therefore have implied ownership of the lot 
Um, it, basically, yes. Um, when you declare, a, say, a, a, a struct within a struct, um, if you don't use a reference, so if you just write the, the struct name itself, um, that is actually sort of like a tuple, it's flattened into it, okay. so it forms one giant structure. Um, whereas if you have a reference to it, um, you need to explicitly say the lifetime, but usually you want to say that the, the inner structure is valid as long as the outer structure is. Um, you are not allowed to say the... It's a bit, a bit complicated, but there are the restrictions on how those lifetimes are related if they're different. Um, so you can't have um, a, a structure pointing to something which is valid for less time because it will mean there's time when the other structure is valid and the inner one isn't. Yeah. Um, a little bit further on that, this is uh, perhaps quite a silly thing to suggest, but can I then have a directed acyclic graph of things referencing one another in that case if it makes a uh, loop or is that uh, provided it's acyclic you could because as long because they're they're immutable references you can have multiple references to it yeah so, so it can yes, be acyclic yes. but as soon as it's cyclic i've then run uh yeah to if, if you have a cyclic thing um that's yeah that, there's, there's basically no way to construct it aside from mutability um well actually one thing that's worth mentioning um when you have a reference to something it is never null um, the references are always valid references. Um, if you want to have an optional reference, what you need to do is say you have an option of a reference. Um, and the compiler has an internal optimization that will just turn that into a pointer that could be null. Um, but, and when you do the pattern matching, it just checks whether it's null. So it optimizes that, but you cannot have um, a null reference. You can only have an option to a reference. Uh, okay. So can you give an example of when you would have a struct with the lifetime of some member references different? Um, the usual reason for that is if the inner structure lasts longer than the outer structure. Um, so say, say you've created um, a piece of data and then you want to um, create a, a second structure that refers to the first one. You go use a second structure for something, pass along to a function. Then that function returns and you throw away the second structure but you still have the first one. Um, so that, that's that's one case where the lifetimes would be different. Would this happen for like collections or something? Uh, collection has to be shorter than everything you put into it? Uh, yes, yeah, that's an example. Um, everything you put in a collection must last longer, th at least as long as the collection. Um, so that way you can't put now, um, short lifetime things inside a longer lifetime collection. Normally the collection will actually own the objects in it though. Yeah. So. Yeah, but it's, it's at least... Yeah, yeah. It, often you have to make it take ownership, but if you didn't and still had a, a reference-based collection, um, everything in it would have to last longer. I'm having connections because um, this is something that... Uh, all this ownership malarkey is something I gave up at bar uh, 15 years ago in C and C++. So why are we going back to it? Is it just because Mozilla? Um, I think the main reason for, for this is ownership is complicated um, and in C and C++ usually you do it wrong um, and you have problems. This is a way of, you have ownership and it's still, it's still as complicated as ownership always is, but it forces you to deal with it and not do bad things. Um, there, are, there are disadvantages to things like um, garbage collection. Um, one of them is garbage collection is generally not deterministic. Um, and it requires runtime support. Um, so some things like you know, like embedded systems or anything like that, that is potentially a problem. Yeah, I've, I heard there's some um, criticisms so of reference counting that can be non-deterministic also, um, but I don't know how true that is, uh, but I did read about that yeah. at some time. Um, could, could I just ask though, when you ported your thing to from uh, Haskell to Rust, did you like it? And is it like elegant, your solution? And, how did it compare? Um, part of it I didn't like was, um, and I mentioned that's mostly about the parsing libraries. Uh, I tried to use one based on Parsec, which started off okay, but then I ran into not having proper function composition. And because Parsec is designed to use all of that stuff in Haskell, um, the straight port of it to Rust didn't quite work, I don't think it quite works out very well. Um, so I don't think that is going to be a great Rust parsing library. 
uh, may be something that takes inspiration from Parsec, but is not essentially um, a fairly close direct port, um, might be better. Um, and the second one, um, Norm is sort of written using a state machine. Um, if you ever use iterates, it's kind of like that. Um, that one, I had some problems with it. Well, there seemed to be bits that were missing in it. Um, so I think most of my problems um, were either the early stages of some tooling and error messages or around um, the library ecosystem where libraries I wanted to use just didn't exist yet, um, which is, is obviously a fairly major thing, not having libraries for all of this, and that seems to be picking up pace quickly, fixing that and getting libraries out there, but it's still kind of an early stage where it's not settled what the best way to do certain things in last are. What, what about, because um, I just keep going, I've got at least yep. two more questions I'll um, have you Have you heard of, there's a, at least a couple of other programming languages that kind of um, at least have optional where they don't need to use garbage collector in that. One of them is APS, it's like an ML. Sounds very similar to Rust, except that it's got optional garbage yep. collection, which to me that sounds pretty wonderful. So in the places that you think you really need to be very careful because say there's a bit of code where you just don't want to allocate because uh, you've locked the heap or something weird in a, in a kernel or something weird, right? Uh, but everywhere else, like for normal applications, you'd probably just want to use garbage collector. And that way you can use this as a general purpose programming language instead of something that's designed for simply, it seems to me, simply kernels and some, something very special like uh, embedded systems. Um, because they, as far as I can tell, people are thinking about using Rust for everything, and it sounds really ridiculous to me. Yeah, um, there, also there, there are a few people working on garbage collection libraries for Rust, um, and all dynamic memory allocation is part of a library in Rust. None of it is in the language, so um, it's just the, the reference counting stuff um, is in the, the standard library. So if you... Um, someone had written a, a garbage collection thing where you just had um, a, a GC type to go with um, RC, um, it wouldn't be any different from a user point of view um, as to using it, it would be it's exactly the same as using GC instead of RC. Um, the, potentially the problems with garbage collection are sort of the interactions between things that use garbage collection and things that don't. Um, that is probably going to be one of the issues. Um, and the other issue, which is something that um, they did look at and hasn't yet been sorted out in the 1.x series, is um, abstracting over um, reference types. So abstracting over RC and box and ARC and that. Um, you probably, probably want that view abstracting over garbage collection as well. Um, I, I don't think Rust is necessarily bad to use for um, everything. Um, I don't. I haven't used it enough to be sure of that. Um, it may turn out that for a lot of the things where you've got high-level languages, it, it doesn't provide advantages. Maybe it does. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, have, did you uh, have you heard of ATS or ERD? Uh, did you come to the last meetup? Someone spoke about the. Uh, yeah, I came to the one about uh, um, I, I think I've heard of ATS, but I don't know anything uh, about it. Far from I think that's part of the problem, but it's no, no, no fault of your own. It's a fault of the people at Mozilla. Texas is getting cold. Oh, <laughs> really. Sorry, I'm running out of questions. Just doesn't really solve these problems, do yeah. What's yeah. that? Like, the problem of like having code that's not garbage collected and code that has a runtime of garbage collected. Yeah. Like, Rust doesn't have a garbage collector built in because they don't know how to solve that problem and ATS just doesn't solve it. They yeah, it doesn't. It, does. it does. You don't have to use it. No, I know. I, I understand. Well, that's that's not really like solving it, like yeah. switching it off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 you have this as 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 how does that not solve it? Sorry, I don't get it. Well, uh, let's say you had some, um, yeah. some some garbage collected code, which called um, other code that uses non-garbage collection things, yeah. and they call it, I think that, that's probably the, that's one of the tricky things. Sounds unsafe, but I think it wouldn't compile. I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, essentially, it is uh, in um, Rust, uh, the box type can hold, um, we can have exactly one reference to something. Yeah. Um, the weak type is essentially zero or one references. So anytime you try and get the thing out to use it, um, it returns an option. So I believe what it does. I haven't really looked at that though. Yeah. Thanks, James. I reckon James.